All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the Food for Talk. Um, normally at the Fletcher Free Library, um, but this time here at City Market in the South End. Um, for those of you who have never uh, joined us before for Food for Talk, this is a little different format. Um, today we're doing uh, we're going to do a demo at the beginning uh, with Adele Dieno and she will be making some pasta. Um, and then afterwards, we'll be going and doing um, the talk in the normal format we do on Zoom. That link should be in your uh, email that you got where you found this one. Um, so I'll tell you more about the Food for Talk then. Uh, just stick around. Um, during the demo, if you have any questions about the demo as it's progressing, feel free to send them in somewhere on there you should see your what's what do you call it Robert? it's q a or chat q a or chat option um feel free to send in questions about the demo um during it and we will field them to adele and then at the end um i'll probably do a little q a with her as well um and to find out more and so if you have any questions about her or what she does or anything like that save those for then and then we will talk about uh the book after this in the Zoom meeting, and I'll get to see your faces and say hello to you there directly. So I'll turn it over to Adele now. Okay, thank you, Richard. And thank you to Barbara and the Fletcher Free Library and Carrie here at City Market. And for all of you who decided to stay near a computer, I hope it's or a phone, I hope you're outside enjoying part of this day because it's really beautiful and uh, we have a lot to celebrate. So um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in an Italian American household and pasta was definitely on the table almost all the time. Both my grandmothers were pasta grannies and they made pasta. So I've been making pasta since I was five, which is a long time. And uh, Sunday was when we had pasta together as an extended family, uh, mandatory. Go to grandmom's house and you were having homemade pasta. That was just the beginning. So um, I've had a lot of pasta, but I'll be honest with you, I didn't like homemade pasta growing up. I would only eat it out of a box. <laughs> I know, I missed out on a lot of good meals. But um, so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to make pasta dough. It's really easy. The hardest part really is trying to find semolina flour. They're out of it at the co-op. They had some in the cupboard, so I was really lucky. Uh, you can use any flour, but I do prefer the traditional semolina flour. And that looks like this. It almost looks like a very fine, can you see that okay? Yeah. Um, a very fine corn flour, but it's not. It is a wheat product. So if your friends are gluten-free, you can try this with buckwheat. And I love buckwheat noodles. And they're really expensive, but buy the flour and you can make them with the same techniques that we're using today but I don't think you want to use tomato sauce and try to get by making an Italian meal out of buckwheat noodles. So it's very easy. I'm actually using a measuring cup, but I think my grandmother just used to use her hands. So for a basic recipe of three cups of flour, three eggs, a little salt, and half a cup of butter should feed four people. So, but if somebody eats a lot, or a little bit, it's different. Um, so you take the three cups of semolina flour, because I find that that's a good quantity to do. I have gone as much as tripled this recipe. It gets a little hard to handle with your hands. So um, I would recommend doing no more than six cups at a time. And I always do it this way. I have a KitchenAid, I have a Cuisinart, and it just has to be done by hand, that, as far as I'm concerned. So you take a little bit of salt and mix that in. You don't need to salt it very much because really the way pasta cooks, you salt the water heavily when you're cooking the pasta. You don't need to do it this way, but it's not going to hurt. So um, we have the little salt. And now I always get the question, what happened to my fork here? Hmm, okay. If I can have a, a fork, thank you. Um, I always get asked, do I have to do it on a table? People really feel like, oh, I've got to do this in a bowl. Um, you can do it in a bowl. It just, 
um, I think it's much easier to do it on the table. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but in your book, The Pasta Grannies, and it, certainly if you go online to any of their videos, you'll see that all those grannies have a special board, and my granny had that board too. And I wish I had that board, but I don't. Um, take that out of there. Uh, and it is nice to have the board for a couple of different reasons. And I think the grannies had it because they didn't have miles and miles of granite countertops the way we do in our kitchens now. They had a kitchen table and they worked on their kitchen table. And to keep everything nice and neat and clean, they had those special boards with a lip so that when you were kneading the dough, you didn't, you were pushing it away, but the board didn't slide down the other end of the table. So they really are very functional. So what you do is you take the eggs and you scramble them. And I've always used the word scramble and I noticed in the pasta granny videos, they use that word too. But over the years of me doing classes, people find that thinking that I'm making scrambled eggs and I'm not. It's just really a process of beating up these eggs and you just beat them until they're a kind of a consistent yellow. You just don't want to see yellow and white separated. Now, the other thing, the next thing that I'm going to do, because you never know how wet the dough is going to be because the different uh, size eggs vary. And we're putting water in this too. Now, you can also make pasta without eggs. You can use them just with water. But for all the work, I think it tastes much, much more delicious and it's also um, more nutritious for, to use the egg. So if you're going to go through the effort, I definitely suggest that that's what you do. I always like to leave a little bit of extra flour on the side because once you get your hands dirty, it's kind of difficult to go and get some extra flour. So the first thing I do is start, by the way, I wash my hands very well first. You want to put a little flour on your hands. I'm going to bring in a little flour from the outside of this well that I made before I scrambled the eggs. And you want to be careful, kind of like in that little science experiment of, um, you know, uh, what's it called, a little um, volcano. You don't want all that drippy egg going off the table. So I bring in enough from the outside so that my egg is not running off the side of the table. I hope you can see that there. And you can see it's starting to thicken up. And you start to knead the dough. And it's just like kneading bread or kneading pizza dough. It's all the same. And I kind of bring in some of the flour to incorporate it into the wetter ingredients. And I keep doing that and I move the dough around. I'm sure most of you have worked with bread dough. What's nice about this is you don't have to worry about having water be too hot and kill the yeast. There's no yeast. And uh, one of the things I tell people in my classes is I tell you about things um, that can be mistakes because I've made them all. Like the first time I ever made bread, I said, mm, warm water, hot water's gotta be better. Well, I had a brick <laughs> and that was it. Well, I learned. So I'm turning this and if you take a look at the dough here, can you see how it's separate? You can see that it's yellow and white and chunks. People say, how do you know when you're finished kneading the dough? Well, there's a couple of different ways. One, it looks more homogeneous. It's a nice consistent color as opposed to being the separates of white. You'll feel the dough and I'll show you how you touch the dough with your finger and when it springs back, it's ready to set. Now that's the other thing. You do want to let the dough set for at least a half an hour because that brings out the elasticity in the gluten. So I already made uh, one recipe of dough before we started so that you don't have to wait 30 minutes <laughs> for the dough to uh, rest and become more elastic. So 
Someone is asking how long you've been cooking for. A long time. Um, uh, well, I used to cook with my, really with my grandmother on that board and make pasta. Even if I didn't eat it, I liked making it. Uh, so since I was a child, but I honestly was a very picky eater in my personal life. And um, I think it was part of rebellion with my um, Italian ancestry. And so I didn't eat their homemade anything. I had a very limited palate until I went to Europe and realized what I was missing. <laughs> so and now I love to cook Italian food. I love to cook in general, and I love sharing that cooking and easy cooking. It doesn't have to be hard. You don't have to uh, worry. I mean, the worst thing you're going to do is poison somebody. And, you know, if you just keep to good, uh, healthy cooking habits, you'll be fine. So maybe there's a little too much of one thing or another. It's it's okay, you'll see. And for today, while I'm still just working this pasta and trying to keep you entertained here, um, I made two sauces, very simple. Um, I'll show you the jar in a minute, but I always like to use Delamori sauce because they're from Vermont. They're in Winooski, they're made right here. I love his sauce. You can have it plain out of the bottle Oh, thank you, Richard. And Richard said his first job ever was at the old Philomena's, which pre, pre yeah. was, uh, the predecessor of Delamori sauce. Yeah. So that was pretty funny. Um, so I made a simple sauce. I always keep Delamori sauce in the house because you can just put that over pasta. Today, I did two different sauces, which believe me, they really only took minutes. One is going to be a meat sauce because Barbara and her family like meat sauce. And I'll tell you, I made that just by sauteing up until really clear an onion in a little olive oil with a little salt so the onion doesn't burn. And then I added um, a pound of really good Vermont beef, sauteed that up and added Delamore sauce. That's it, that's a meat sauce. You don't have to make meat sauce. <laughs> which are all work. Um, the other sauce that I've made is Delamori sauce, heat it up, add some cream, put in some uh, fresh Parmesan cheese. That's for Carrie, she's a vegetarian. <laughs> so you can please everyone with a pasta dish. Uh, someone is asking, did you say you could use whole wheat flour instead of semolina or white? Yes, you can. I would not suggest using all whole wheat flour. I would suggest uh, using some white flour with that. Very often I will use white flour and spelt. Spelt is my um, go-to other flour, although I just discovered a flour that I really, really love, Fricka, and it's really delicious. I found it at Price Chopper and I said, ooh, I took oh, a look. Oh, like Frika? Like F -R -E Frika, F-R-E-E-K-A-H. -E -E oh, yeah. I've never seen it as flour before. No, I didn't. Oh, well, I never saw it as anything before, oh. but it's delicious. Interesting. Yeah, yeah it's like a green wheat. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Because it's it's a light brown mm -hmm. in yeah. flour. You'll, you'll see it in uh, uh, Middle Eastern. Really? Yeah. And as a flour or a grain? No, I've never seen it as flour. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. They may use it as a flour, but I've never seen it. Yeah, and I think with it, they um, they harvest the grain when they're still green. So like oh. they have the right wheat and they burn it. So there's like often. Oh, so that's why it got the yeah. brown color. Yeah. Well, it's really delicious. And, you know, hey, this uh, pandemic is going to hang around for a while and um, it's going to be winter. And I think people are going to be doing a lot of baking. So uh, flour is going to be the old toilet paper. When you do other flours, do you, do you have a ratio you work with? Oh. No, and um, I use the same ratio, which is three cups of the flour, three eggs, half a cup of the water. And if it's too wet, add a little more flour. Yeah. If it's too dry, add a little more water. It's very forgiving. That's what I said, be relaxed about the whole thing. So you can take a look and I'll show you how this is going here. It's getting better, not ready yet, 
and I kind of like bring in a lot of the flour from the table as I'm doing this. And I'm pushing and turning. And by the way, the most strength that you have in your hand is not in your fingers, it's in your palms. So when I'm rolling this, if I want to use my fingers, I'm just not getting much pressure on there. But if I use my the palms of my hands and I'm really pushing, it's much more effective. This is getting there, I promise. When you're cooking at home, do you measure or do you just eyeball it? Well, I do use just do the three measure? cups. Same. Yeah. 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 Um, but I'm not going to um, use a scale. Right. Although I was so surprised that pasta crannies, some of the recipes talk about a scale. Are you kidding? I tried to get recipes from my family. It was, oh, a handful of this, a little bit of that. There, someone is asking, um, when you are looking for flour, how do you tell the size? The book, re the book references size is a lot, like the double O, I don't know what you're referring to, but I haven't noticed the size on the uh, you mean the double O is the um, pot as the pizza pizza dough flour, which is white flour. It's just fine, and if you get it imported, it will come from Italy. It'll be a lot more expensive. Like I did order semolina flour from Italy back when I couldn't find anything in April. So this is getting much better here. Yeah, I think in my experience, double O is the only thing that I would sort of call a size with pasta. I've never seen. I'll right. The size. And it's just a white flour. Yeah. Okay, this, we're really getting there. And if you can see, it's forming itself into more of a ball. It's not separating. And so we're going to do the finger trick now, which I'm going to put my finger in. It popped back. It's ready. So we can put this aside. So here's my dough that's been resting already. So now. Ask, what's your favorite Italian dish? Ooh. You know, I gotta tell you, I am uh, hmm, dish. That's a good question. I don't know, I just made homemade pizza last night. I really love homemade pizza. Do you want me to cook them? Oh, please, thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm hearing from um, Mark that uh, the, the questions are hard for viewers to hear, um, so I will speak up a little bit. Um, and also, or I can repeat it. Yeah, and Nadia uh, Market in Winooski has uh, plenty of semolina and they also have three mm -hmm. eggs. Oh, great. Good to know. What, and what's the name of that again? Uh, Nadia. Nadia? The market's on the... I think the Iraqi market. Right up, up the hill. Okay. Oh, I see. Right yep. I know where it is. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to take a hunk of the dough and leave the rest covered, especially when it gets to be winter and the heat's on. It will dry out. Not the end of the world. But what's going to happen is you'll get a crust on the outside and the crust will then get incorporated into your nice, fluffy, spongy pasta dough. So um, let's see if you can take a look at the pasta machine over here. How are we doing to be able to see that? Uh, yeah, no, looks good. Okay, so pasta machines. <laughs> I wish I could tell you there was some rhyme or reason, but they're kind of like onesies for babies. The systems are always different. Mm -hmm. So you have these two rollers here. As they separate, they make the pasta thicker or thinner. It's adjusted by a little wheel here. The wheel will always have numbers. In this particular one, one is the widest. And then by turning it, you have to kind of pull it out and turn it. It can go down on this particular one as low as eight. But you could have another machine where the thickest is number 10. No rhyme or reason. I think mine goes to six. <laughs> six, see, doesn't matter. So, uh, but one thing I will say about the pasta machine, if it's made in China, just walk away. You, it, it won't last, I'm sorry, it won't last. So um, I definitely recommend getting a machine that's made in Italy. And people always ask me, oh, where can I buy one? Well, you can buy them at kitchen shops, but just make sure that in fact, they are made in Italy and check because sometimes the wrapper of the box 
lets you assume that it's Italian, like Fontas in Philadelphia, which has been famous for years, they now have their own brand and it's made in China. It used to not be. So anyway, just beware. So the first thing that I'm going to do is put a little more flour on here and I roll it out to begin with. And I always like to do this. I like to make one end thinner as in a small tongue. See how this tapers here? Because when I put it through, and in this case, it's going to be number one roller, number one size, it will catch better. So I, wrote, I go through once. You don't always have to put a little flour, but when you roll it through once on, the th on that thick setting, then you fold it over and you go through again. And what I like to do is do this at least three times for each setting. And the reason that you're doing this, you're aligning all of the fibers in one direction. So I do it like three times and then depending on, you know, how much fun you wanna have with this, you can um, go down one setting at a time. I usually don't, I usually go down a few settings, but what you can't do Remember I told you that I've always made my mistakes? I'm just gonna show you this first off. You don't wanna go down too quickly to a thinner setting because it's going to just come apart. You can't force it to be thin too quickly. So I just want to let you know, don't do that. And if you did do that, no problem. Not the end of the world. Just put it back, go back to your other setting. That's two, and just put it through again. You're okay. Now, the other thing is you'll notice that I am doing this all by myself, but I've been doing this now for oh, probably, oh, I don't know. I don't want to say it's over 65 years. Let's put it that way. Um, so if you have two people doing this, this is much easier. So I'm doing this and every time I put it through, after the first time that I've adjusted it thinner, I fold it over. So now we're going to go down to number four. That'll be good. You'll notice I'm putting a little bit of flour in. It really goes by feel. If it's too sticky, I give it a little more flour. So now I went to four and I, oh, I would never suggest doing it on the thinnest setting because the thinnest setting is just too fine. It's way too much. So I'm gonna now go down. I went from four, I'm gonna go to six. Are we okay? Yep, yeah, I'm just zeroing in on the coffee maker. Okay. So, so again, now, does this develop text, better texture by sending it through multiple times? Is that the yes? Yeah. And you're aligning those fibers so they uh, will, and and you're compressing them too, at a more even rate. Because think of this: you're going to be cooking this pasta in water. If you have one piece of pasta, oh, and I should tell you that, make sure when you're adjusting for the final thickness that it's always the same. Because if you did one little uh, grouping at two for the last setting and then another one at eight and you put them in the same pot, one is going to overcook. And there is nothing worse to an Italian than having overcooked pasta, I promise you. So now I'm gonna go down to seven and I wanna show you something. Someone gave this to me a long time ago. I don't recommend that people use electric devices for making pasta. One reason is the machine is going to make you go faster than your mind or your hands can. So you're more apt to not be as successful. But someone gave me this one time, which only fits on certain brands of uh, pasta makers, of which this one it does. Okay. Well, let's see, usually it goes on here very easily. There, okay. I just want you to hear what it's like if you're using an electric pasta maker. And my, I have a, a 
KitchenAid and I have a nice attachment for that, it's even noisier. So, and by the way, if it gets too long, because every time you compress it, the length is going to increase and that makes it more difficult for you to be able to uh, handle the dough. I cut it in half. You can do that. There's no law against that. So I've thinned it down to seven. Here's the noise. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> So I'm gonna go through this again, put my handle back on. Put this through. I'm gonna put this one aside for a little bit. So again, I'm going, I put it down to my last one. Now I've forgotten if I put this through once already, but I can tell as soon as I put it through here, I didn't because I can see it, I can feel it compressing and it's getting longer. And notice it went and um, had some wrinkles in it, no big deal. The more you put it through, the finer it gets, the wrinkles will disappear. And you'll notice that the dough itself is squaring up. It's becoming more of a rectangle. Okay. I was asking if it's possible to make this without a pasta maker. Yes. Oh, yes. It is possible to make homemade pasta without a pasta maker. And you know what? I'd love to try that with you sometime in the future of this long winter that's coming. But there are tricks to it. Because one of the things that happens whenever you're rolling out dough with a rolling pin, because that's only one roller. This is two rollers going in opposite directions, so mm -hmm. it brings it out. When you're doing pasta by hand, it's springing back. So you think it's thin, but it's not. It springs back. And if there's a technique for actually stretching it and flattening it at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice in some of the pasta granny videos, they show you how they flip it over and then they cut it with a knife and they line it up. And I thought that was really, really cute. Um, but you know, there are other pastas that you can make that you don't need a pasta machine for that are equally or in some ways even more delicious, I think, like, you know, gnocchis. And there are some really easy gnocchis. So yes, you can, and maybe we will. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so I have this through here. Now, you'll notice the, um, usually the pasta makers come with an attachment for making the actual spaghetti or spaghettes as my grandmother would call them. So there's the thinner kind, which they would call a linguine, but actually it's more between a linguine and an angel hair, but, and they always have a little thicker one. The thicker one is fettuccine. I recommend that you do the fettuccine because the linguine is thinner. It has a tendency to be more difficult to handle. So I would always say definitely the um, fettuccine. I have some other attachments at home to make lots of other different pastas, but uh, this is fun. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to add a little more flour. And then I'm going to put it through. Hmm, you're not gonna be able to see this from that angle, but okay. So I'm putting it, I'm putting it through again. And this is where a uh, second person comes in, but don't worry, I can do it. Can you see this okay? And that's, that's a pasta. And I kind of like toss it, put it in a little loosely um, circled pile and I'll do it again. I don't know why this one's squeaking. Oh. Before I get any further, I must remind you, you never ever put water on your pasta maker. You, I, and why? Because I had somebody once who thought they were doing me a really nice favor and they put it in the sink. 
And I had to take it apart and I couldn't get back together in and I had to send it to the factory. So don't do that. I'll show you how to clean it at the end of this class. Okay, so I'm gonna do another one here. How are we doing? We're doing good. Okay. So again, I wanna get it started. Remember, it's that little tongue that I'm making. So we have the tongue. I have to flip this handle back. Again, I have to start at the beginning with the smallest number, one or 10, whatever it is. Put it through once, fold it. I like to press it down a little bit because then that is kind of like the tongue that gets it started in the machine. I like to do that about three times, you know. Um, Cost making is great fun, and I think it's delicious to eat. And many years ago, I realized this takes quite a bit of time. I'm running through this pretty quickly. So I would get there and I would make pasta, and it would take me you know, a good hour, and then you have to make sauces and things, and people would, I'd do it all by myself, and people would sit down to eat, and in 10 minutes, they'd be finished. I said, hmm. I think it's a, this is a great activity to have people help you with. It's participate. Oh, this is COVID. Okay, um, do it with your family. And if you want to start this, do it telling your family we're going to do this and we're going to do it together. And maybe you get to pick out the different shapes or different people get to pick out the different shapes or different flowers or something. So again, I'm making it a little bit thinner. So I put it through the first time, it's fine. And you'll notice that the flour is being worked into the dough. Okay, and I press it down again and I put it through again. That's number two. Does so that additional flour um, that you're sort of working into, is that kind of getting the, to a certain dryness as well? Yes, certain... because you don't want it to be too wet because when you put it down like this, it will stick together. And then you'll put it in the pot and you'll have like pasta glob. Mm -hmm. And this is where I say, you know, so it's a little wet to begin with. That's okay because you can always, um, you know, make it drier by adding more flour. If it's too hard, that's not a problem either because what can happen is um, it's just harder for you to turn. That's awkward. And that's not so bad since nobody's going to the gym anymore. <laughs> this uh, will suffice. But you'd say better to err on the side of the dryer pasta. Than I think so, yes. Yeah. 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 And you're probably going to ask me, oh, can we put this uh, in the refrigerator till tomorrow? Yes, you can. I don't usually freeze my pasta dough like this. Um, I will maybe cut it up into smaller pieces if I have something and use that for, um, put it in soups later or I will make raviolis. And raviolis freeze really, really well. Last week I made pumpkin goat cheese walnut raviolis that were just out of this world with a sauce of just butter and fresh sage, which I still have sage in my garden. So I'm gonna cut this because it's getting unmanly. And I always want to make sure there's a little more flour when I put it through um, the fettuccine part. Because then when I put it on the side here, um, it'll be a little better to not stick. So again, you have to transfer the handle to the other side. And this is, this is the part that kids really love. This is the exciting part. I'm sorry that the camera isn't on the other side, so you can't see it, but I'll try and bring it up like this so you can see how beautiful it looks coming through. Actually, you hold it right there. Yeah, you can see it. Okay, I'll do it again. Okay, did you have any questions? I'm sorry for that squeakiness. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Any other questions from? No, I don't have any more questions. Are you hungry yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not really. Can you smell the sauce? You know, I can't smell the sauce, but. Um, can't smell it? No, not through my mask. Oh. <laughs> Could I ask? Um, yeah. So, where in Italy is your family from? Well, three of my grandparents are from Abruzzo, which we, you will notice that they're. Uh, are some of the cooks from the pasta grannies are there. And oh, I'm glad you asked that question because my family actually owns a um, artisanal pasta making company where they use bronzos. That's the old extruded pasta, which is now the method that they use for making artisanal pasta here. Um, you know, when years ago and probably no one is, not many people are old enough to know that like when I was a child, Italian food was like dog food. I mean, they looked at it like this is foreign and you know, wh why do people want to eat that? And now you know, people go crazy for Italian food. So um, hopefully the, the world will be more accepting of other cuisines as time goes on. Uh, but they have this company called Giuseppe Coco Pasta and I actually have a link which Barbara is going to send out at some point. Um, and I've been to the factory. It's delicious pasta. I've been told it's the best dry pasta commercially produced in all of Italy. So they're very proud of that. Um, it was my grand, my maternal grandmother's sister, Arufo, who married a Coco. And he made the uh, pasta equipment to, for um, the Checo pasta and the pasta industry. And he is, he was knighted, Cavalieri, that's what that is, because of his contributions to the economy of Italy and the production of, of uh, pasta. When he retired, he went with his sons and started an artisanal company. And Someone is asking, uh, do you plan to pasta dough for the Christmas Okay, the question was about hanging pasta to dry. And when I grew up, that's how my grandmother made the pasta always. She made dried pasta. Dried pasta is without eggs when you're doing it at home. Mm -hmm. So if for that reason, I usually, I don't do that. I usually use it fresh. You can, and I have used that. There's something that's kind of like a little clothing rack, a miniature clothing rack that you can use, but really, when, when my grandmother did it, it was beautiful. They had chairs and they would put um, bamboo, uh, sticks of bamboo across the chairs with a white bed um, sheet on the floor because you don't want to get the floor dirty. And they would hang the pasta over that. And when it was dry, they would put it in boxes to save for when we were having the big meal. So that's one way if you have to do a lot, but um, I prefer to have it fresh. And it only takes like two minutes to cook. Uh, is it harder to make spaghetti rather than pasta? Because it's not cheesy. Yes, because it's finer and it will stick together more. At, it's more apt to stick together. And then when you put it in the pot, you're going to have pasta glove. You might want to say that spaghetti is a little harder than fettuccine. Yes, be just because it's thinner. And, you know, angel hair, which I do have one for angel hair, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the different shapes and sizes of pasta are ha directly related to the sauces that you put on them. So, like, in some of the pasta mama recipes you've seen where they uh, are using, like, a little board that has lines on it. Well, that's designed because you're going to have um, pasta that's going to catch into those little pockets and taste different. And I will tell you now, but I will tell you again, when you're cooking pasta, you really do not put oil in the water. I don't know where that came from, but I know it is, it is definitely an urban legend there. But if you think about it, putting um, oil and cooking the pasta with the oil 
then when you take it out and you're trying to put your sauce on it, the sauce is going to just fall right off because it's oiled. It's the same thing, um, you know, like when you do salad dressing and you're doing the oil and the vinegar separately, you don't put the oil on first, you put the vinegar on first. Never thought of that. I didn't either till I went to Italy and the Italians told me that. A lot of these things, I, you know, my grandmother, and I think that we talked, Barbara and I talked about that a little bit with the pasta grannies and the videos of the pasta grannies that there are some things that are missing because they've just done it so much. They don't think about those little differences. You use salt in the water though, right? You salt the water and you heavily salt the water. And, you know, I never used to do that, but when I went to my family's in Italy, because it's kind of cool, they, they live in the same house for the last 250 years, family's still there. Um, they're the ones that told me, oh no, you, you've got to put the salt and salt it heavily and salt it right before it comes to a boil. Don't do it, don't put your water in. I don't know why, but that's what they said. And, you know, I'm not gonna argue with them. Do you use a fine, a fine salt or a coarse salt? You know, it doesn't matter, but just realize that regular table salt, like Morton's, it has the um, least amount of saline in it. And the stronger is, then it goes sea salt and then kosher salt. So if you put in, I don't know the exact equivalents, but you know, if you're going to put in kosher salt, put in a little bit less than you would if you were using um, table salt because it's going to be so much stronger. That doesn't matter for the coarseness, it, it matters for the intensity. Okay, so I'm gonna do this one. I can almost see the rule about putting your salt in right before just being one to remember if you had put the salt in. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I never used to put salt in and that's when they said, yeah. you have to. Do you? Do you sort of a large pot of water or smaller? Oh, that's a good question. Yes. I'm sorry for the squeaking. Um, now, so it's a good thing my husband isn't listening to this, but when he cooks pasta, and he does sometimes cook pasta for himself, um, he will put in a small pot and a lot of pasta. And I say to him, you can't do that because think about it for a second. You need to cook the pasta. If you put a lot of pasta in a little water, you're putting, the water's hot, you're putting in room temperature or cooler dough, and a lot of it, it's going to lower the temperature of the water. You're going to poach the pasta. So you want to have a much larger amount of water. You can't have too much water, okay? Which reminds me, maybe we should turn up that water because we're going to be ready to cook some of this soon. Turn off or turn up? Oh, up. Make sure it, you want to put it in a, a rolling boil. Oh, squeaky, squeaky. Oh, wait one second, brother, because I just went up. I won't hear you for the squeaking. Go ahead. Uh, someone says, it looks like the pasta sheets are getting wider than the machine space and getting crumpled in no. the edges. Is that a problem? No, it can't, it can't because you've got the sides on the, on the pasta machine. So repeat that so they, they, they can't hear me. Okay, uh, let me, uh, so the question was, it looked like the sheets were getting wider than the pasta machine. Impossible, because there's a certain width and if you notice on the pasta machines, there's a little like wall here. Let, let me show you that, okay? I'm just gonna do this one. And I have found, for whatever reason, the longer pasta sits out, the um, like the dough, it gets wetter. I don't know why. Okay, we're going to go back to number one here again. If you have any more questions about the actual pasta rolling, this will probably be the last time that I go through this one, even though we have a little bit more dough. So. Fold it over, put it in again. Now, I'm gonna keep doing it on this first one, so you'll see. It's getting wider, yes. 
but it's also squaring, I call it squaring up. It can't get, um, it can't go beyond the sides. It's like impossible. And it's, I think those sides actually act to bring the uh, dough into a, a, you know, a square pattern. Can you see this over here? Yeah. So even, and let, let's say I wanna do this, okay? Let's say, oh, there. You can feel the elasticity in this. Mm -hmm. You wanna turn that a little, okay. So let, let, let's say I'm not paying attention, the phone rings or something, you know? Um, watch, the machine is making it go into like a channel. And it's okay if it came across and one is not as thick as the other one, this is very forgiving. This, this is not like, uh, you know, making profiterole dough or some of these other things that um, you have to have everything exactly right. I, I think that's too frustrating. So we're doing that again. I'm gonna go down again. I might go down a little quicker this time. Okay, flower. No questions? Yeah, no, I've got a uh, couple here. Okay. How long does this take, this dish take overall? To make the pasta and to the sauces and everything? Um, I'm gonna say depending on what you do. I mean, we've been here talking a bit with this and it's taking almost an hour. I I'm gonna say leave yourself two hours, especially in the beginning, but don't do it by yourself. It just, you know, get somebody else to enjoy uh, helping you because that makes all the difference time-wise. Just will be much easier for you. Now, I know that this is going to get quite a bit thinner so and longer, so I'm just going to cut this now. Uh, I was going to ask, what, uh, did your family have other traditional shapes of pasta they did? Well, they did the cavatelli, like my daughter was reminding me, and um, which is kind of like a gnocchi, but gnocchi is made with, um, well, there's several different kinds, but the ones that we're most familiar with are made with potato. But they also have a semolina, gnocchi, mm -hmm. which I've made with corn, with um, polenta flour instead of semolina, which is great for gluten-free people. Mm -hmm. Very easy very forgiving, very delicious. Um, so I don't, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So again, and look, I've got some, um, I've got a little wrinkle in there and I noticed that it's getting unruly. So I'm just gonna cut it a little bit, it's okay. She says, I was gifted a second hand pasta maker that had been stored in a basement and it smells musty. Hmm. If I can't clean with water, what would you recommend? Um, good question. Hmm, that's a very good question. Put it outside in the sun. And guess what? This is the perfect next couple of days. Put it out in the sun right now. Um, the sun does a lot to help mustiness. And you could even, if you wanted, if it, uh, take, take it without the plastic or the wooden handle and put it in an oven for a little while on low, very low. Well. And don't forget it. Now this, what happened here was it got stuck on the other side because it could use just a little bit more flour. The, uh, the, the reason to not wash or uh, use water with it, would you say is it uh, you don't want it to rust or because the flour that's in there is going to make no, up? No, the rust, the rust. Yeah. The rust. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to show you how to clean this um, also because that's important because if you leave, if I were to put this pasta machine away like this and come back a year later or two or five as people might do, you're going to have mealy bugs and it's just going to be a mess. So 
Um, I clean it without water. I use a little pastry brush and I'll show you one other um, thing that I do because there's a little place underneath here that gets, the dough gets stuck, I found. Okay. See, this is where another person holding it just makes it a little easier. And I can feel that this is a little sticky. So I'm just gonna put a little more flour on here. And if you were to leave it connected on top of each other and it was a little wet, it would grow to stick together, which we don't want. So a little more flour and you'll notice maybe there's a little tear here, no big deal. And I see it seems like you keep reasonable shapes. You're not trying for a super long piece of fun. No, I'm not. But it's so funny because my cousins, when they gave me one of their gift boxes of, uh, actually they sent it to me, which was really nice because it weighed so much I couldn't have carried it on the rest of my journey. Um, they had, a, they make a pasta in their gift box that no lie is like twice this long because the way they dry it, it just comes around. It was amazing when I tried to cook it. It was like, well, how do you eat this? It did get eaten. <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay. By the way, it makes a mess of the floor. So uh, if you have to clean your kitchen floor, wait till after you get done making pasta, not before. Almost. Any other? Um, did you say you could freeze the dough? Um, yes. I generally only freeze it after I've already made raviolis, just because sometimes it's just, I, I just don't think that it tastes as good when it's frozen as we call this macaroni or in Philadelphia, by the way. Um, they call it macaroni and they don't call it sauce, they call it gravy. You know no why. Nobody knows why. They do. So, okay, let's see. I have, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put all of this in the water because we have a big pot of water. Actually, I'm going to use what I like to use is kind of like a tray that I can slide it off into the water. This one, okay. And since you're making this with egg, I want you to realize, oh, thank you, that um, this pasta is going to grow, as my grandmother would say. In other words, it's going to expand when it's cooked. So. How many people do you think this will feed? Really? I still have one little bit to go. So let's say we have another half a person eating. That's a lot. I'm going to come over here. Uh, I don't know if we are transferring the Got camera. Yeah. Okay. Oh, what did I almost forget? I almost oh. forgot the salt. Oh, all right. Remember I told you to salt the water right before you put it in. Richard said, yeah, remember, right before you put it in. I'm putting in a lot of salt. Okay, I'm going to put this in. Now I'm also going to use, my family told me this because I bought this at a, at a um, uh, what do they have in like a uh, sale in the in the uh, park at their town, Barra San Martino. Three prongs on a wooden fork is for stirring pasta. Four is for salad. <laughs> you didn't know that. Okay. You didn't know that. Okay, we're going to put this in here. We're going to put the pasta, pasta, pasta. And so I'm going to stir it because we want to keep everything nice 
10. Moving around, we do not want to toss the ball. And that's what happens if you have less water. If I toss the ball. So as you, as you said, with fresh pasta, it's only like a two minute cook, right? It's like two dry. minutes. And people will always say, oh, well, how long does it cook for? And I remember, I never grew up with this, but some, as my grandmother would say, many God, came up with the idea that you throw it up on the ceiling and if, it's, <laughs> if it sticks, it's done. I said, what, I never heard of such a thing. I don't think any pasta granny would have improved. Yeah, I don't think idea. so either. But you know what? <laughs> you just put your fork in, you take one piece out. And you taste it. Remember, it's going to keep cooking. I'm going to wait just a couple more seconds here. And I was telling Richard before we started that we're doing lots of serious business in Italy. And when there are large institutions that have to make pasta for lots of people, they have a device that looks like a dishwasher, but it's not. It actually heats the water very quickly and cooks the pasta and starts it again. It's amazing. This is serious business, I told you that. Okay, so I really like to use a sieve like this. It's rounded, and you can't see me, but if you turn it, centrifugal force is going to make it easier, I think. So I have some red sauce here. And then, I'm going to mix it up. I have a bowl over here. Turn this off. Hmm, I wonder if, because I'm not, if I could have that clear bowl. Oh no. Yes, clear bowl. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to put this in here. You know, they say you're supposed to use a little bit of the pot of water to help with sauces. And I just figure, well, you know what, there's enough water that when I transfer it like this, it's fine. So, sauces, the vegetarian sauce, which Carrie is going to have, and the meat sauce. So what I have here is some heated marinara from Del Mori and cream or light cream or half and half. You know, winter's coming and if you don't have cream, you're not going to want to go out to the store. That's okay. You can just use something else. And by the way, I if I have cream like this and I haven't used it, I put it in the freezer just like this. I cover it up, put it in the freezer. I've even had it whipped, but normally I wouldn't depend on it if I needed like whipping cream or something. So I'm going to put in. This is hot. So I just have the cream, the Del Mori sauce. Let that here a minute, then I'm going to, I'll be right back. Oh, I want to show you this plate, if it looks familiar. The top, the pasta brandy's cookbook has a plate. And this is the same pattern. It's from Faenza, Italy. Oh, and yeah. it's called Gelufano. It's the, it's the pattern of that area. Really?
you eating now or are you talking? Are you going to talk and eat to people? <laughs> <laughs> This, I'm, playing, I'm playing to talk and eat. <laughs> so let's. You want to talk and eat? Yep. Okay, so always Parmesan cheese and always fresh. They never would. In fact, I had an Italian guest live with me for six months, and that's when I, I used to use crafts out of a little box. And she said, What? What is this? I said, It's Parmesan cheese. She went, No, no. Never Parmesan cheese. <laughs> Never heard of anything like that. So this is the pasta sauce. Very simple. Now what do you call this sauce? Or this sauce? I call it a salsa rosa. Like it's rose, right. it's the color of a rose. It's so simple and it's so, so good. And it's less tomatoey, although, you know, I never even ate a tomato until I was 20. Crazy. Okay, so we'll put a little more cheese on. Um, there we go. Um, I don't know if you want to grab some plates. Are we going to eat and talk? Right, yeah, so we'll have to. Yeah. Oh, we're, yeah. you're masked. Yeah. Can't do that. Okay. Um, yes. So, what we'll do is um, maybe we can sort of line, you know, search it up and um, uh, we'll, um, we're going to do a toast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's in a wine glass, but it's, it's actually grape juice. <laughs> so I will actually put the, the grape juice hopefully inside of the camera. <laughs> okay, and well, thank you. you. We're on the, thank you very much. What's the toast? Uh, well, I have to pasta every Sunday. Pasta. pasta. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this, <laughs> and I hope you'll make pasta again and again and again. And you can, if you're home, you can drink a little wine with it, too. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, you can email Barbara. She'll be happy to send them along to me, and I'll be happy to answer. It's going to be a long you. winter. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks, City Market, for letting us use this beautiful kitchen. Yeah, thank you.